Hello, welcome and back. now, a reading Sorry from On Liberty videos. by um, John Stuart Mill. Chapter 1, Introductory. Know. The subject of this um, essay is not the so-called um, liberty of the will, so unfortunately opposed to the misnamed sort of doctrine thing. of philosophical necessity, but civil or social liberty, know. the nature and limits of the power which can be legitimately exercised by society over the individual. A question seldom stated and hardly ever discussed in general terms, but which profoundly influences the practical controversies of the age by its latent presence and is likely soon to make itself recognized as the vital question of the future. It is so far from being new that, in a certain sense, it has divided mankind almost from the remotest ages, but in the stage of progress into which the more civilized portions of the species have now entered, it presents itself new conditions and requires a different and more fundamental treatment. The struggle between liberty and authority is the most conspicuous feature in the portions of history with which we are earliest familiar, particularly in that of Greece, Rome, and England. But in the old times, this contest was between subjects, or some classes of subjects, and the government. By liberty was meant protection against the tyranny of the political rulers. The rulers were conceived, except in some of the more some of the popular governments of Greece, as in a necessarily antagonistic position to the people of people who they, whom they ruled. They consisted of a governing one, or a governing tribe, or caste, who derived their authority from inheritance or con conquest, who, at all events, did not hold it at the pleasure of the governed, and whose supremacy did not venture to contest whatever precautions might be taken against its oppressive exercise. Their power was regarded as necessary, but also as highly dangerous, as a weapon which they would attempt to use against their subject, no less than against uh, external enemies. To prevent the weaker members of the community from being preyed upon by innumerable vultures, it was needful that there should be an animal of prey stronger than the rest, commissioned to keep them down. But as the king of vultures would be no less bent upon preying on the flock than any of the minor harpies, it was indispensable to be in a perpetual attitude of defense against his beak and claws. The aim, therefore, of patriots was to set limits of power which the rulers should be suffered to exercise over the community. And this limitation was what they meant by liberty. It was attempted in two ways. First, by attempting a recognition of certain immunities, called political liberties or rights, which it was regarded as a breach of duty in the ruler to infringe, and which, if he did infringe, specific resistance or general rebellion was held to be justifiable. A second, and generally a later expedient, was the establishment of constitutional checks by which the consent of the community, or a body of some sort, supposed to represent its interest, was made a necessary condition to some of the more important acts of the governing power. To the first of these modes of limitation, the ruling power in most European countries was compelled, more or less, to submit. It was not so with the second, and to attain this, or when already in some degree possessed, to attain it more completely, became everywhere the principal object of the lovers of liberty. And so long as mankind were content to combat one enemy by another, and to be ruled by a master on condition of being guaranteed more or less efficaciously against this tyranny, they did not carry their aspirations beyond this point. The time, however, came in the progress of human affairs when men ceased to think it a necessity of nature that their governor should be an independent power opposed in interest to themselves. It appeared to them much better that the various magistrates of the state should be their tenants or delegates, rev rev uh, revocable at their pleasure. In that way alone, it seemed, could they have complete security that the powers of government would never be abused to their disadvantage. By degrees, this new demand for elective and temporary rulers became the prominent object of the exertions of the popular party wherever any such party existed and superseded, to a considerable extent, the previous effort to solidify the power of the rulers. As the struggle proceeded for making the ruling power emanate from the periodical choice of the ruled, some persons began to think that too much importance had been attached to the limitation of the power itself. That, it might seem, was a resource against the rulers whose interests were habitually opposed to those of the people. What was now wanted was that the rulers should be identified with the people, that, that their interest and will should be the interest and will of the nation. The nation did not need to be protected against its own will. There was no fear of its tyr 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 tyrannization over itself. Let the rulers be effectually responsible to it, prompting re promptly removable by it, it could afford to trust them with power of which it could itself dictate the use to be made. Their power was but the nation's own power, concentrated and in a form convenient for exercise. This mode of thought, SNAS Manx, this mode of thought, or rather perhaps a feeling, was common among the last generation of European liberalism, in the continental section of which it still apparently predominates. As those who admit any limitation to what a government may do, except in the case of such governments that they think ought not to exist, stand out as brilliant exceptions among the political thinkers of the continent. A similar tone of sentiment might be, by this time, might have been prevalent in this in, the, uh, in our own country if the circumstances which for a, but in political and philosophical theories as well as in person success, success discloses faults and infirmities which failure might have concealed from observation. 
The notion that the people have no need to limit power over themselves might seem axiomatic when popular government was a thing to be only dreamed about or read of as having existed at some distant period of the past. Neither was the no that notion necessarily disturbed by such temporary aberrations as those of the French Revolution, the worst of which were the work of an usurping few, and which in any case belonged not to the permanent working of popular institutions, but to a sudden and convulsive outbreak against non-monarchical... Thank you. This has been uh, On Liberty by John Stuart Mill.